So the theory of rings is very similar to the theory of groups. We've introduced the axiomatic definition of rings in our previous video and gave you some examples. And then if we progress to the same story that we went with through groups, much, much faster though, a very, a very natural thing to talk about next are rings inside of rings. That is so-called sub rings. Let N, excuse me, let R be a ring and let S be a subset of R. Now we say that S is a sub ring of R denoted S is less than or equal to R, just like we do with groups. If S is an additive subgroup of R and it's closed under multiplication, that is a sub ring is going to be a ring inside of another ring using the same operations of addition and multiplication. That is, if we just restrict addition and we restrict multiplication, we get a ring structure still. Um, we say that R is a well, if R is a ring with unity, we say that S is a sub ring with unity if S is a subring and it contains the unity of R. We have to be very careful in this definition here. So when we talk about a subring with unity, it's a subring that contains the unity of the larger ring. A subring with unity does not mean that it's a that it's a subring that has unity. It has to be the same unity. It's very possible in fact that you can take a subring of a ring which has a unity which is different from the unity of the larger ring um, it could that could be for example because the larger ring has no unity to it whatsoever like uh if we take for example the ring of matrices of the following form let's say let's take matrices a b zero zero something like this where a and b are just real numbers right you can prove that this set of matrices is 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 a ring with respect to matrix addition and matrix multiplication in the usual sense, um, but it's without unity, right? There is no there is no matrix which acts like unity for this ring. But on the other hand, we could take the subset S, which consists of, let's say, A000, like so, where A is a real number, right? So this would be a one-dimensional subring in this situation, for which this one does have, this does have a unity. We could say one, or sometimes they call it U for unity here. This would be the element one, zero, zero, zero. You could show that this acts like a unity on the subring S, but that's not, a, that's not, it's not a unity for the whole ring, right? Um, and so that's kind of a curious observation. We have a subring which has unity, but it's not the, it's not the unity of R. So we wouldn't call it a subring with unity. It's a subring but it does have unity. I know that the language might seem a little bit weird here, but this is an important distinction. Um, what's even more bizarre is that you can have a subring of a ring with unity, and the subring is a ring with unity, but because it's a different unity, that doesn't count as a subring with unity. Uh, so for example, consider the ring R cross R. So we could define the direct product of rings analogous to how we define the direct product for groups, um, for which as a set, um, we'll just take the Cartesian product of the two rings in play here, and we define addition and multiplication component-wise. That is, we just add together the first components, add together the second components. We multiply together the first components. You can multiply together the second components. All right. Um, and so this, you can argue that the direct product of two rings forms a ring. Consider the subring S defined to be all of those ordered pairs X comma zero, where X is a real number like so, you can show that S is a subring of S, okay? Uh, in which case, you'll then see that R has a unity. I'll let you think about what that unity would be. S will have a unity, and S is a subring, but the unity in S is not the unity in R. In fact, S doesn't contain the unity of R. It has a different unity. And so it's very important when you think of rings, uh, subrings with unity or not, to be a proper subring with unity, you have to have the same unity as before. Uh, so to kind of make some comments about that. It's kind of a weird thing because the, the restriction of the set does not guarantee that you contain the unity. And there's no accidents that will guarantee that if you have unity, it's the same unity. That's something very different we saw when it came to groups. If you had H as a subgroup of G, for example, and if it, this is a subgroup H, then it's a group inside of a group, in which case it has an identity. So how do we know that the identity of H is the same as the identity of G? Well, the short answer was cancellation. Because we have cancellation inside of H, you could then infer that the, the identity of H has to be the same identity of G. 
in general rings, we don't have cancellation and multiplication. That's, that's a topic we might talk about some other time. And because of that, we can't guarantee that the unity of the sub ring is the same unity as the, the mother ring there. Now, some examples of subrings that we're familiar with, like we're familiar with the field of complex numbers. The field of real numbers is a commutative subring with unity. The field of rational numbers is a commutative subring with unity as well. And being a subring is a transitive relationship here that if since Q is a subring of R and R is a subring of C, then Q is a subring of C, right? And they all have the same unity. Likewise, the integers form a subring of Q, which is in a subring of R and C. And this is a subring with unity. All of these guys have the same unity. And of course, if you take the integers, you could take any, uh, you, you take your favorite integer Z, then NZ, this would be all the multiples of N. This forms a subring of Z. It's a commutative subring, but these are not subrings with unity because NZ itself doesn't contain any, uh, doesn't contain any, it doesn't contain a unity.